Well, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Zongwei uh, Zhu, I'm butchering the name, I'm sorry, um, to Cornell. Uh, Zhongwei is a postdoc at, uh, in computer science at Hopkins, um, and he received his PhD a couple of years ago uh, at Arizona State University in the field of biomedical informatics. Uh, his, his research develops um, algorithms for medical image computing, computer-aided detection, and diagnosis. Um, he is, has received an AMIA doctoral dissertation award in 2022, an Elsevier Media Best Paper Award in 2020, and a Mikhail Young Science Award in 2019. Um, and today we're going to hear about John Wei talking to us about um, how we should be scaling our data sets, annotations, and algorithms for large scale biomedical image analysis. Good afternoon, everyone. It's very pleasure to be here and get invited. And uh, I'm Zhongwei Zhou. This is my third year uh, postdoc at Johns Hopkins. And uh, I got my PhD in biomedical informatics. And uh, now I'm working on computer vision with uh, Alan Yuor. And uh, today I will talk about the scaling data set annotation and algorithm from two perspectives. Application and methodology. So these two components is also very important part of my research philosophy because you know the there are many methodology have a beautiful uh, theoretical uh, theory in, behind that, but it may not have a direct application in the real world, and this can demotivate people to dive into all the uh, math and everything. And my job is to understand the principle and find the right application, especially in medicine, to be able to uh, make attractive. On the other side, you know, there are many clinical applications. You can address it like a brute force way. You, you spend a lot of time, a lot of effort to solve it. And my research is to develop the novel methodology to be able to solve it in an efficient way. So these two combined together have always motivated me to move forward to the medical image analysis field, which is a combination between the algorithm, computer vision, and the clinical application healthcare. So I choose the medical imaging because the imaging data is come for over 90% of all healthcare data. And the medical image have been generated every day in hospital and the quantity have far beyond the expert radiologists can interpret. So we believe AI can at least assist them, let's not say replace them, can assist them to make it faster, especially in the country that lack of expertise. And uh, actually, the AI have demonstrated its uh, usage in medical domain as well in the past few decades. So here is an uh, uh, example of uh, co uh, the lung cancer diagnosis. If you give the algorithm a medical image, it can tell you what's, uh, uh, what's the cancer inside. So let me give you a, another example of a, a liver tumor segmentation. So, on the very right, you can see the state of art deep learning. It can set not only segment the big um, organ, but also it can segment the abnormality from the uh, image. And you can compare with the ground truth annotated by the human expert. They are pretty much similar, but two problems comes. One is you need the radiologist to sit there in front of a computer to annotate this image one by one, and uh, it's not one or two, it's a hundred or thousand of the image, and uh, uh, tell the algorithm where it is and how big it is, and even whether it's a benign or malignant. So you see, this is an extremely time-consuming process, and uh, only with this, the algorithm be able to perform that well in one specific task. So you see, it's not easy to really apply the AI in many, many tasks that we are interested in the uh, clinical practice. So my research has been focused on how to reduce this kind of uh, annotation for the radiologist to be able to also develop a pretty good AI system. So. The first chapter of my talk is focused on methodology. The goal is to reduce the manual annotation for a radiologist. And the application focused on computer-aided diagnosis. So here, this 
diagram is the simplified uh, pipeline, how the AI can inter integrate into the healthcare system. We have a lot of image every day and they are unlabeled and we pay a lot of uh, money and ask uh, expert radiologists to annotate uh, one by one and then train the model and uh, test and evaluate, retrain the fine tuning, whatever, and until it's uh, uh, stable, robust to uh, many um, uh, scan from the different hospital, then we can uh, confidently deploy them into the real setting. So in general, when you uh, collect more annotated data, the AI performance will gradually increase. Of course, it will um, increase the slowdown if you have uh, more data, but this not usually happen in the medical domain because we don't have so many um, uh, annotated data. And uh, my goal is to reduce the annotation is always focused on this diagram. So I did three things in my PhD. The first thing I did is how to find the subset of the data from so many unlabeled data to send it to the radiologists first to ask them to annotate, right? So uh, because the assumption is we cannot annotate so many data. And this is called active learning. The principle is to find the most uh, uncertainty, uncertain cases for the AI and find the most uh, diverse case uh, to be annotated because you don't want to spend the money to annotate similar cases every time. So here I propose a method to integrate uncertainty and diversity together. And the application three uh, report in the paper shows that by doing the active learning, the annotation cost can be reduced by over 80%. And this paper was first presented in um, CVPR. And the second thing I do is to have a certain amount of annotation. How are you able to design the advanced architecture to make good use of this annotation more efficiently? Okay, so in this aim, I focus on the organ and the tumor segmentation, and the improvement is made uh, based on the uh, very popular UNET architecture. And we modify this architecture in two ways, so we call it a UNET++. First, we redesign the skip connection to be able to aggregate different level, different multi-scale, multi-resolution feature more efficiently. And second, we try to incorporate deep supervision to uh, make the UNET++ training more stable. So the advantage compared with the original UNET architecture is that UNET++ can detect a very small tumor. If you look at this box, maybe it's already uh, missed. So this is in general a very healthy liver, but there is a small tumor here. So the UNET will miss this, and uh, uh, by UNET++ it can detect this very tiny uh, tumor um, accurately. So this is actually important in clinical practice, especially because um, of the early detect purpose of early detection. And uh, we present uh, three applications in UNET++ paper, but of course it has been appreciated by the research community. Many other uh, um, research groups have been used UNET++ and uh, make uh, great improvement in terms of uh, accuracy, segmentation accuracy in many different uh, organ, body parts, and uh, tumor and a different type of image modality, not only CT scan, but MRI and ultrasound and many more the cell, the uh, Microsoft images. And the third thing I did is to think about how we can directly make use of unlabeled data. So previous to Abe, we are focused on oh, how to get the annotation and how to make use of this annotation. Now, okay, we, since we have so many data generated every day, is this possible to train the model to directly on this large amount of uh, data and uh, use the transfer learning to transfer to different uh, uh, diverse downstream tasks? And uh, here, uh, we produce the first 
um, pre-trained the 3D model for medical image analysis called Models Genesis. Why is it important? So uh, back to uh, 2019, if I ask you, hey, I'm working on the 2D medical image task. Do you, I don't want to train the data, uh, model from scratch. It's uh, too many parameters. Do you have a recommendation which model I can start work on? So you can say, oh, ImageNet is ImageNet pre-trained model is pretty stable. But if you ask someone, what about 3D modality? Yeah, there's no 3D pre-trained model for general purpose. You can start at least to work on it. So model genesis is the first public available 3D pre-trained model, and it has uh, pre-trained without using any, any um, menu annotation. It uses mask image modeling. Basically, it removes some uh, uh, content from the original image and do some deformation and ask the model to learn to restore the original content. And by doing this, the model can learn the specialized uh, image feature to medical domain, and it can learn the consistent body anatomy. It's totally different from natural pre-training. And also, a uh, big advantage is directly pre-trained on 3D medical data. And it has been demonstrated really good transfer learning capability. So put this. Are you going to go into the details of any of this, or are you going to move on? I'm not going okay, to the can detail. Ask a question about yes. Can you go back one second? Slide. Um, how much? That's very aggressive masking. Is that typical of the amount of masking you apply in this uh, in models genesis? I use a 25 percent to 50 percent remove content, not like uh, Camille Hurst paper 75 yeah. percent. I don't do that. So. So you found that to be an optimal range, 25 to 50 percent. Yes. Okay, and your masking is literally um, like patches, mask patches, or how do you mask? Is there... It's actually not like uh, so graded patches. It's uh, random patches, so they can overlap with each other. So ah. the arbitrary uh, shape. And the architecture is a unit? Yes, because we found if we use the most popular one, of course we can use unit plus plus. If we use the most popular one, then people can do more things on top of it. And when you say deformation, are you, do you actually mean uh, masking? Masking and uh, linear, uh, non-linear transformation basically changes the intensity value. Oh, intensity, not, not geometry, geometry. Not geometry. Okay. But uh, we also do the shuffling, so shuffle the content and uh, let the model to restore the original content. Local shuffling, so shuffle the pixel. Got it. How do you solve the issue of uh, the gap between uh, training and the fine tuning? Yeah. Uh, in the fine tuning, you probably need, need uh, the input probably is the full images. Yeah. Well, in, in training, the input is kind of a masked cropped. images. Yeah. Yes, crop. It actually depends on your uh, task, uh, downstream task. Usually, the even the downstream task, your input also patches because I don't see many people put a 512 by 512 by 200 into the unit directly. Only if you want to segment the big stuff like lung. But if we segment a liver tumor this small, you usually use patch. You don't use the entire CT. Yeah, and my question is that uh, uh, the input for, uh, for the pre-training and the fine-tuning is different. Yeah. So this can be different because we aim to do the general purpose pre-training. Not only the input can be different, the input modality can be different. So we train on lung chest CT, but we also demonstrate it's uh, transfer learning is better if you use uh, MRI as input. So that's uh, so because you don't want the pre-trained model on ImageNet, it can only apply to ImageNet. So it also shows benefit on the chest X-ray. So this same thing, if we train on chest CT, we also demonstrate uh, uh, the advantage on the MRI, or brain MRI even. Yeah. So you start out with these weights and you just do your typical fine tuning yes. as this is your initialization. Yes. That's fine. Yeah. So we so ImageNet pre-training is our model. We right. we want to do something like a more generic instead of you uh, stuck into one uh, body range or one modality. And this is a fully convolutional architecture, so it can accept, uh, in theory at least, any grid size, as it's said. Yes. Yeah. So the model architecture is uh, independent to this work. So that's the end of my three things I do in the PhD. So if you have any question, that's it.
a good time. About UNET Plus Plus, you said that you had two contribution added. One was deep supervision, and then one was combination of the uh, skip connections, right? Skip connections. Which one do you think is more effective, or it depends on the application? Uh, so they are uh, good in different ways. So deep supervision is not really like improve your performance like dramatically, but it can stabilize your training. So your training curve will be better. And also it can it's have a benefit in uh, segment small things because if you aggregate a, a shallow layer and uh, do the deep supervision directly, it, it can uh, benefit to the small objects. And for the... Um, redesign skip connection, we actually, the idea is taken from DanceNet. So UNet is like a U, uh, U shape, but it's a rest, residual uh, connection. But you think it's, uh, the aggregation is not too like, aggressive. So uh, I just think, oh, hey, why, why not densely connect it? And the- So from every cell to every other scale? Yes. And uh, also another benefit is also uh, different from the Accuracy, it's a clinical usage. If you use a, a dense connection plus deep supervision, you can uh, cut the layer in the inference time. So, for example, this inference, you only need two depths of unit. Okay, other things you can remove. You cannot do this in the unit because it's fixed architecture. But if you do the dense connection and the deep supervision, then the two depths can be independent during testing. In the training, it's not independent then you can you deploy this if the accuracy is good. You can deploy this directly into the uh, computer. During training, can you make that stochastic? Could you randomly choose what your depth is in training time? That's uh, what other people follow up work. So I review one paper. It's actually uh, well written. They, they do what you suggested. Mm -hmm. they, they even, so they make it more like uh, architecture search. Mm -hmm. So they make this uh, weight mm -hmm. even uh, uh, learnable. <laughs> That's pretty good. I, I review I, I review this paper recently. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, and we started uh, call number for the transforming uh, stuff, like uh, when you do the model uh, analysis, how much improve? Or yeah, like that. You have a caricature of like performance improvement. Like, how much does yeah. it really improve in real applications? Yeah. Uh, for which work? Yeah. For Unit Plus Plus, this no, is no, not no, what. Plus, model genesis. Our model's genesis. Yeah. Compare with the learning from scratch, it's really improved a lot, but it depends on the application. Yeah. But uh, it also uh, fast your training. So you don't learning from scratch. You need to put into uh, put the model into the optimal. Uh, local optimal or global optimal, but uh, you, you pre-train it, it's uh, uh, ideally uh, close to that optimal. So, you so did that. you compare with like pre-train using ImageNet, for example? Yeah, yeah, we then. compare. Yeah, ImageNet pre-training have a limit. It can be applied to 3D imaging. You just need to do layer by layer, or you can do 2.5D. Yeah, we also compare with that. but. Uh, we all know it's uh, solving 3D problem into 2D is not ideal. Okay. Yeah, we also compare with other large model. So this is the first model in 2019, but uh, uh, months later, many people have uh, released uh, like Tencent and uh, Google. They all release their pre-trained 3D model. We also compare with that. Okay. Yeah. And Matt, did you compare your, uh, your model performance, fine-tuning performance with UNET? And UNET was a story in 2021. Okay. <laughs> so we actually implement a models genesis into an UNET framework. And uh, if you check the GitHub, I'm sure you can find the GitHub. We provide the pre-trained an UNET and find the improve. Okay, great. Yeah, welcome to use. <laughs> So all three works are public available, the code. So if you are, any of them you are interested in, you can feel free to play with it. All right. So this is a conclusion. So the idea, as you can see, is pretty clear. Uh, the uh, center goal is to reduce the annotation cost. And I did three ways, uh, an independent way. And this work was uh, uh, reward the dissertation award in EMEA. Then move forward. 
I'm a move to the postdoc, right? Then what I'm uh, try to challenge myself is, hey, we are always using annotation. Is there any way we can get uh, rid of this? So I explore the tumor synthesis. So in bigger term, it's data synthesis, but current to my focus is tumor synthesis. And how this work done? So you have a lot of uh, images. Most of them are healthy image. So we, instead of uh, uh, collect a small tumor image, which is difficult, we collect so many healthy image and implement some artificial um, tumor into it. So you see here the doctor become a programmer. We try to implement this into the image. And because it's a tumor synthesis, we have 100% control of the tumor that we want. We can control the location, the texture, the shape, and everything. And the, another benefit, we automatically can generate a lot of image and the mask pair to train the model. I have a question. So how do you ensure that the tumors you are generating are representative of That the is the next slide. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yeah, I repeat your question. Two problems arise. First, as you said, how do you make sure it's realistic? Second, if it's realistic, how can you make sure it's useful for training AI? These two questions we need to answer. And the first answer is using visual <laughs> tooling test. So Turing test is very common in the computer vision. It, if you pass the, if one algorithm pass Turing test, which means you confuse the uh, professional and uh, which one is produced by professional, which one is provided by machine, then you pass it. So we did this on the six year radiologist and the 35 year experienced radiologist. And here is a Turing test example. So we mix up the real tumor and the synthetic tumor together and ask them to tell, hey, which one is real, which one's fake. And you say their accuracy is very low. And for the junior university, uh, jun sorry, junior radiologist, their accuracy is below 50, which means uh, lower than random guess. And you can also challenge yourself to tell me which one is real, which one's fake. <laughs> I don't know if we have any experts in the room. With the coding. Yeah, they, they won't play with the contrast. And yeah, we... They not only look at the image, they yeah. look at the, the other... That's a fair point, yeah. So, so when we send them, not like a P PNG, we send them the DICOM, so they can do whatever they want. Yeah, but, uh, they look at multiple faces as well, yes. not only one image, so... Right. Here you only show them, it's very difficult to, to say. We have a, a comment from Dr. Margolis who says these are pretty good. It's yeah. <laughs> from what he's seeing on his screen. Yeah. Yeah. But um, my question is, um, if you gave me a classifier and you said it's a binary problem, we did that. Said, no, no, I'm not. I'm not. You said it's thirty percent accurate. I flip those labels and I say I, what I say is there's some signal there. So if a, if a a non-expert six-year radiologist mm. is below fifty percent accurate, I don't know how below. Flip it. Um, then they're picking up on a signal, and they're, but they're confusing it. Yeah. So there is some difference between what's real and what's synthetic, but it's just they're, 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 they don't know which way to read this. Yes. So how, is that how you interpret that result? Or So in my mind, that means that there is some difference between what's synthetic and what's real. It's just the radiologist couldn't figure out how to disentangle those. Two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good point, yeah. So the expert radiologist, like 35-year uh, expert, experience is a 75% accuracy. So they know something, they, they know there's different. But uh, And uh, another thing interesting we find is we give them choice to do un unclear. So real, fake, unclear. So if they are not sure, they can choose unclear. So the interest pattern is uh, usually junior radiologists are really, really confident, okay? <laughs> I, so I, I know this is real or fake, but the accuracy is pretty low. But the senior radiologists, really, they are doing the job and uh, they look into it. So I think it's important if you are unclear, you're unclear. Then, <laughs> so that's another interest. Yeah. Train the radiologist first to show them maybe 50 examples of synthetic tumors. So they can, I mean, they've never seen a synthetic tumor before. So yeah, that's not their daily job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but if you, I'm wondering if you train the radiologist, like you care 50 examples of synthetic tumors. Mm. Now 
here's another set of 100. Can you tell me which ones are real and which ones are synthetic? Yeah, actually, we show them that before the real tooling test. And we, are, we cannot do this by ourselves programming, like do it so good at the beginning. So we do it human in the loop. So we first uh, generate some uh, tumor that we think is realistic, send to them, hey, and they said, this is horrible, this is not a real tumor. And uh, what we ask is give, give us some feedback. So what's a real tumor should look like? Why this uh, same fake? So this, uh, we train ourselves at the same time, train the radiologist at the same time to get them similar to this task. And we, based on their, their feedback, we adjust our algorithm then uh, eventually, after many iterations, we figure out this is a good parameter. Another fundamental issue with uh, synthesis is that um, it's hard to disprove the memorization, especially if your data is large. Mm. Uh, you could have memorized, like, are you showing closest cases to your synthetic images? <coughs> no. We randomly pick up the right, sample. So it, it is entirely possible that what you're saying synthetic is it's just one of the training examples slightly perturbed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's a real image, basically, that you perturbed by a little. Like, like the, 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 so that's one of the biggest issues in my mind about synthesis. Oh. Like, you say I've generated a synthetic image. Mm. Like, um, was it Captain Sparrow the other day? I was watching like a demo. They were showing the evolution of um, some of these synthetic images, and the final image looks hyper realistic, but it's almost identical to an image that exists yeah. out there in the world. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a synthetic image anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's important to, to show the closest image in your training data as well as. I see. I see. That's a good point. Yeah, here what we do is uh, only synthesis tumor. It's not. So you can see this is realistic because it's real. We only put the tumor into it. So that's why, because we don't use a fancy uh, method like a GAN or diffusion model. They have a lot of parameter ways to generate a healthy anatomy. But we have so many healthy images. Why do we want to spend the computational tool there? So we do is very different. We only synthesize tumor. So and you have a real healthy version of that image. Put on it, yeah. And then you superimpose the tumor image. Yes. I see. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, and this also is very easy to scale up because for the disease image, it's difficult to get, and you need to report everything. You need a bi uh, biopsy, but a healthy image is pretty easy. So the routine uh, CT scan, you can you can scale up this algorithm. So for example, the liver tumor, the public available data set only 100 for both training and testing. You can imagine how limited you can do. But if you use this one, the public available healthy scan is 100, it's 1,000. You can always put it into it. And it also can uh, resolve the domain gap issue. So you want to collect the healthy image from this hospital, you don't have annotation, it's fine. We just uh, pick the uh, image and put your uh, tumor into it and the algorithm can work on your uh, hospital. So Maybe I didn't catch it though, but are you using some network where you have uh, a set of tumors, you feed it and then you hope that it learns how to make a tumor? Or do you have some simulation where you will perturb the image itself with like your synthesized tumor and it affects the CT signal? Um, is it I, a machine learning approach, or you it's a handcraft process? approach? It's not a learnable approach, so okay. that's the limitation. So it, people challenge me. So if you change a, a liver to kidney or other things, can you work it? The answer is no. It cannot directly apply. But you need to work with radiologist to figure out what's the characteristic it is. It's not a learnable approach. But to be honest, the learnable approach cannot work on different organ as well. So uh, that's uh, what we are working on right now. The summer project try to do some learnable approach plus some handcraft approach to put together to be able to generate a tumor in general. All right. So now I answer first question: the realistic. Then. People care about the performance. So if you are realistic tumor, then how it compare with AI train with the real tumor? So AI train with real tumor, to be fair, is difficult because you cannot uh, uh, collect so many data. But, and it can achieve a score 58. 
but we uh, train with a synthetic tumor with a similar amount of uh, CT scan, we can achieve 60. And uh, we now scale up this training set and can achieve even better die score. So the, the approach on the right is uh, something I really want to uh, uh, advertise in this content. And another perspective so is more... So have you got proof that it increases your performance as you, as you scale up? Sorry? Like you, you're showing a die score of 60, mm. and the, the, the conclusion is if I synthesize much more data, I can go up to 90%. Oh, 90% may not, but maybe... <laughs> so what's that ceiling? Do we know what that ceiling is? Yeah. We, we do, yeah. We are doing the... Uh, scaling up uh, experiment, not published yet, but we are doing. It. We think it's a good direction to go. Okay. Do you have a, like a ballpark? Like, can you get into the 70s, 80s, in terms of the die score for this particular problem? So for this problem, uh, 65 is the uh, most we get. I see. Not not dramatically because. Yeah, so for to be clear, for here the scaling up, we not only use synthetic tumor, because if you have a cool technology, you don't want to miss the material you already have. So since we already have hundred annotated label uh, tumor, we also use it. So we mix them up and see how what's the upper bound because we don't want to really win the competition or anything to show some uh, improvement over algorithm. We really want to solve this problem. So, how confident are you in the manual annotations? Are they potentially very noisy? It is noise, especially for the mal malignancy, because usually malignancy tumor is a fuzzy, the boundary. Yeah, but for the benign or the cyst, they are very um, smooth. The, so it's the reason easier. I'm asking that is, um, in theory, if you purely rely on synthetic tumors mm. to train your model, mm. With infinite data, with infinite capacity, you should be able to reverse engineer that and find with 100% accuracy where the synthetic tumor is. For synthetic tumor, yes. Right. Yes. So there is no upper bound, actually. It's 100, like the upper bound is 100%. If it was just everything was synthetic, you had infinite data to train yes. on and an infinite capacity model to invert that. Yes. Right? You yeah. Agree? So the fact that you're stuck at 65% to me is, is an indication that your manual annotations are not noisy. Hmm. I see. Mm. Like, uh, do you have a handle on how reliable your annotations are? are it maybe if, if you did test retest reliability, you're at sixty-five percent. Yeah, that's uh, something we really need to join the Cornell because, the, <laughs> <laughs> you know, people to annotate. Yeah, what I can do so far <laughs> is purely public available data sets. I see. You I know, see. yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a really good motivation. Yeah. <laughs> we have worked on it, like doing these cysts annotations. They're the really tough. The specific cyst. <clears throat> Not yeah. necessarily tumor, but there's like polycystic liver disease, yeah, yeah. AKD. They take a long time to segment between observers, and different observers can segment different parts of the right, system. Yeah. Is pretty... And it's very time consuming, so it's been a pretty difficult problem. I agree with you that yeah. it's probably that the tumor segmentations are not perfect. Yeah. 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 And we not only uh, evaluate on the die score, because sometimes you don't need that accurate boundary. Yeah. So what we really care is the benign malignant or whether this tumor detected like at all. Right. Yeah. That's my next slice. I want to highlight the small tumor uh, segmentation using the synthetic tumor. You can imagine, because it's synthetic, you can generate a lot of things that you don't have in the real world, especially small tumor. Because small tumor data is very difficult to collect. At the beginning, radiologists may, may miss, miss this tumor. And uh, since it's missed, it's not in the archive. Uh, it's not in the uh, list. So you don't know, uh, uh, you don't send them to annotate. So this makes the small tumor really, really small in the public domain data set. And we find you, so our strategy is to synthesize a lot of small tumors and find the performance not only visually, but also the uh, number is very Sorry. good. I, yeah. I was just, um, we have a comment in the chat from Dr. Margolis, and he says right. Dr. Prince is working on machine segmentation for polycystic disease. Sometimes discriminating tumor from cyst is tri tricky, even for an old radiologist. Yeah. Yes. Old meaning like experience, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not like deteriorating vision. <laughs> yeah. 
So here I show the number. So previous I show how it's good. And now the number, if you look at this area, so ground truth do have a 300 uh, small tumor, uh, uh, less than five millimeter. And uh, if you use the AI train on real tumor, because of the less example, it's performed not good. The sensitivity less than how, how many? Uh, it's around the 52. But a small tumor cannot be perfect, but it's really boost a lot for in this domain. So we think it's uh, very good for early detection. And also, I want to mention a little bit, it might be useful for the medical education. Because as I said, the junior and the senior radiologists, they clearly have some difference. And their, their knowledge is different. And we, our tooling tests also show their difference. So maybe in the future, ideally, this synthetic tumor can be put in the textbook and train, used for training purpose, right? And try to summarize the tumor characteristics using this. So, OK, to summarize, in terms of methodology, I have been moving from the annotation intensive deep learning to annotation efficient deep learning, which what I have done in the PhD. Then I try to now move to the annotation free deep learning. So it's not means uh, we do not need a radiologist. You can see my approach is really depends on radiology. I don't, just don't want them to sit down and uh, annotate the pixel. I want them to communicate with computer science and the uh, algorithm developer. So that's the difference. It's not, I, it's not annotation free. It's just a manual annotation, like kind of a pixel wise annotation you can get rid of. Then the chapter two, I want to cover the application I have been working on. And here the goal is to develop a 3D representation or 3D map of the entire human body. So in order to work on application, you really need expertise. So you cannot focus on your small application like in this body part. So in order to explore this knowledge, I am very fortunate to be part of this book, the textbook made by uh, at, at, at Ted Shortleaf, and uh, I am my prof, uh, advisor and my um, um, clinical partner have uh, contributed to one chapter called Interpreting Medical Images. So in this chapter, I have been uh, reviewed the opportunities uh, uh, AI bring to medical image, and also I, more importantly, I outline the um, weakness and the challenge we need to meet. So this have a significant broad my view of the and beyond the PhD. So I did this right after I uh, get my PhD. I really thank uh, uh, Shortleaf to give me this opportunity. And this book also very useful for uh, teaching in general. I know I may have a teaching. I may not have a teaching law, but I love teaching. So this book might be a good material. So among all these uh, cool application that you can work on, my current focus is early detection of cancer. This is because my uh, postdoc um, host, the, they have a five-year project, and now it's extend to another five year. It's called the Felix Project. And it's a, a joint, a really big project by the engineering school led by Alan Ewer and the medical school led by uh, uh, Professor Fishman. And the goal is to detect the early stage pancreatic cancer. As you can see, the, this is the deadly cancer, and uh, one third of the cancer have been missing by the radiologist because uh, I look at the CT, even sometimes the PDAC, the P PNAS, the cyst, I cannot see it. Of course, I'm not a, a medical background, but this is really difficult to detect at the early stage. And we found the deep learning have the potential to achieve really high sensitivity specificity if you annotate a lot of data. And what, that's what Hopkins has been done. They uh, annotate over 5,000 uh, high quality CT scan and pixel by pixel. And finally, they reach the human, human uh, performance. It's very high, as you can see. The problem you detect is, only doing one type of tumor, you spend 15 years for one person to annotate. How can you deal with the, so many uh, cancers in the future? It's not, a scale, uh, it's not a scalable approach. 
And of course, we don't really spend 15 years. It's only for one person. We have a lot of radiologists there. So now the project moved to another stage, the Felix uh, uh, Civitas. And the new goal is to detect, of course, early detect the various of tumors, not just in the pancreas, but also liver and other abdominal organs, and also in the lung and the brain. So in order to do this, we cannot do the conventional way, like annotate every pixel. So now the strategy is to build a body map. The concept of a body map is similar to the Google map. So Google map tried to map the entire earth, the river, the building, mountain, everything. And this map, once you established, you can do a lot of cool things. You can uh, travel around. So the body map do the same thing. So you try to segment all the body parts to get uh, separate, and all the organ, vessel, and uh, tissue, uh, and the tumors. And uh, this can be supported to early detection of the uh, cancer. And this was awarded by, already awarded in two grants. And uh, um, my role is a team investigator. And uh, myself also submit, submit a K99 application for this. So it's a huge project. Yeah. And I can take this uh, partially to the Cornell uh, for the record. <laughs> for the public available part. So this is an illustration how the body map will ideally look like. So all the bones, all the uh, organs will be segment. Not only this, and also it will detect the potential abnormality inside all this part. So the first uh, um, achievement we have delivered is called uh, abdominal atlas 8. 8K. And it is a huge data set with more than 8,000 fully annotated uh, CT, CT scan. And that means it can have uh, annotation for the 3.2 million images for the 25 organs, abdominal organs, and the tumors. And uh, think about it. You may ask me how, how much time you spend to create this. If we use the conventional way, it will take 26 years to accomplish this data set. But we use active learning, the interactive segmentation. So we have the human in the loop. So the human only need to annotate the most difficult part, most confusing part for AI, and uh, they 1% of them. And the 99% is generated by AI by, uh, automatically. And we have the quality control, and you can uh, see. Um, so this data set is purely based on the public available data set. It's nothing about the Hopkins data. And we will release it uh, shortly. And the data set is really uh, diverse. It's come from the 27 different hospitals. It's also useful for the domain adaptation research. And the phase, CT phase is diverse. It have a venous arteria delay and non-contrast at all. And uh, yeah, the, the really cool thing I want to highlight is uh, the annotation strategy. So we really move from the conventional annotation strategy into the human in the loop interactive segmentation, and it's uh, speed up by 500 times. And I think this strategy can be used for many, many other applications to create other data set efficiently. And the, having this data set, the second thing we do is to try to get a universal model. So if you guys play with UNET, you, you know what other people was doing, right? So you have a data set, you have a specific goal, you want to segment this thing, then you train a UNET. So next year, Mikai have another data set. They train another unit to solve that problem. But, but why not put them together? So like ImageNet. ImageNet have a 1,000 class. Not necessarily you're interested in 1,000 class per se, but they train it and they eventually adapt to many different tasks. So here, the same thing in the medical. And it have its own advantage because human anatomy is a fixed. You only have this kind of uh, uh, organ. Then we propose to use one single model to be able to segment anything. It's a quote, segment anything. OK, and uh, anything including the uh, organs and the tumors. 
And another fun function we have put into it is the language based. So UNET, you know, it's a one hot coding. You wonder what, you wonder what kind of a class you just uh, make it one hot. It's not good. And we try to make it a GPT-4 uh, GPT uh, style. So in the future, the model input, not only the CT scan alone, but also the text encoder. So the user, including radiologist, patient, or medical school student, they can use this by input what they need, the query. So the query can be very specific. So segment the tumor in the tail of the pancreas and then measure the size. So UNET can do it, but you need to do a lot of uh, pro uh, processing to able to get this. But if you incorporate the language into this model, it can directly give you the answer by concatenating them together. And the query can be very general. So since you, the model can segment many things, you can get query, uh, query say, oh, take a look at this CT scan and uh, segment whatever you think is abnormality. Okay, and it will segment what, what you need. And this universal model is uh, it's in review, has been uh, corp uh, incorporated uh, to two uh, well-established uh, software. One is from the UCB and the UCSF. It's uh, called uh, Simera X. And this software is uh, uh, previously used for biology, but they reach out to our team, say, oh, this we, they want to incorporate into the user uh -huh. interface. Because this, if you put this into the user interface, so doctor can do a lot of things. And the second, we, we uh, have a collaboration with uh, NVIDIA, of course, and uh, they have a good GPU and they have a Monai. They are pretty uh, standard framework in medical image analysis. So in a few months, you guys can see this universal model in these two uh, software. So are you going to talk about the technical details at all? Or? I'm not. <laughs> um, what's the uh, language model? You can tell clip. Us. It's clip? Yeah. I see. And in terms of the accuracy, is it satisfactory? Like, say, segment the tumor in the tail of the pancreas. Do you read what's the quality of segmentation you get out of it? Like, that is the next slide. The quality is really high, and uh, of course, you want a benchmark. <laughs> you want a, a number. So here we're the number one in the really reputable uh, international uh, segmentation challenge. It's called MSD. Maybe some of you heard of it. Yeah. So if you work on segmentation, this one you must go through. Otherwise, people don't know. <laughs> so here is the number one. And uh, you see a lot of similar, work, uh, similar team here, the NVIDIA, the NUNET, and, uh, and so on. So as you can see, the sec yeah, please. Uh, what's the performance of out of distribution performance? Because uh, it, I think this performance is um, in distribution data set. Yes. So you mean out of distribution it's is... Never uh, seen a segmentation never like seen, that before. The test never seen before. Yeah, we, rep we actually reported in the paper, so one section called the generalizability. So we have a Hopkins data, which is different from this. We directly test the universal model into a, a Hopkins data. And it's the performance is similar to what do you train on the hospital data, uh, Hopkins and data. The and the labels are absolutely different. It's, it's you know, types of labels, like semantically yeah. they're different things. Label are same, so, okay, so now, anatomy. yeah, it's the same anatomy. Yeah. But what if like there's a brand new type of tumor in a brand new part of the body that I've never seen before? Do you think you can do that? Uh, currently, we can't because it still need annotation to train. So right. what I talk here is not label free. It still need a label, but just to use public available label. Right. Yeah. If you have a new uh, organ like a appendix, it's never have a lab public available label. Then it cannot do it. But in the future, maybe you can add this to the query and uh, collect some uh, uh, appendix data set, then you can train them. I showed your paper to Merd before. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> so um, the um, vision encoder decoder, is that a vision transformer in the previous slide? It's actually uh, flexible a bit, but in our paper, it's uh, transform plus CN. Transformer plus CN. What? Plus? Tran transformer and CN, hybrid. Architecture, swing unit R. Oh, swing unit. Swing unit. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and how does the clip embedding get it get past to that architecture? 
Now is a pretty naive way concatenation. Now it's already shows. Oh, you just concatenated. Yeah, it's the concatenation. Transform bottleneck. Yeah, but now we are ongoing project. We try to use uh, cross attention. Okay. It's a better way to, but it's just uh, several opinions, <laughs> a different way to combine them together. Right. But the goal is to combine them together. Sure. So, um, so the performance, if you love number, the average ranking is not incremental. It's not like a 12 to 10 or 10 or something. It's 10 to 5. It's a big jump. It doubled the position. And not, not very easy to overcome this performance. How many were there uh, segmentation tasks in this? Uh, 19. It's to cover the MRI, cover the CT, cover a lot of things. So you see this is one number. It's actually average of yeah, yeah. Fifth, uh, seven, uh, 19 class. Uh, may I ask a question? Uh, how many more images did you use compared to Swing Unit? It's exactly the same image. We use this Im uh, data set. Oh, sorry, you mean for training? training yeah. Oh, for training, we assemble 14 public available data. So the idea we try to sell is not to win this competition because we really want the accuracy of solving one task or several, many tasks. Now people, I find, they are stuck in one data set and train the model. So why not do assembling? So this is a demonstration how it can boost the performance dramatically. So it's not a fair comparison, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> it's not fair comparison. But I think the future is uh, use whatever you have the material to train the model. Instead of, uh, oh, you win this competition, you use this data set. It's not uh, very good. Totally agree. Yeah. yeah. OK. So in terms of application, I want to sum up. So uh, I try to move from the early detection of single cancer to multiple types of cancers. And uh, the strategy is to build the 3D version map of the entire human body. And to do this, I have uh, developed two uh, really important tools. One is a huge database, which is fully annotated, but not uh, a radiologist, not so painful. It's a, a semi-automatic. Uh, and the second thing I did is uh, um, develop a, a very strong algorithm to be able to uh, integrate the language and the vision together into one uh, framework. And uh, here to re uh, recap the title, so I'm a big believer of uh, uh, scaling data set, annotation, and algorithm together in the future of the medical imaging analysis. And here, the scaling data set not really mean, oh, the radiologists may uh, seem really worried. Oh, this guy wants a scaling data set. What do we do? We don't do that. So we need to collect the data we have and mostly healthy data and uh, to uh, exploit the tumor synthesis to be able to uh, train the model. And the annotation, we, we also don't want uh, people to do one by one. We want the more efficient annotation, humane the loop, and the more focus. If you really want to spend the time focus on the novel disease or real disease and so on. And finally, the uh, scaling algorithm, I wish to incorporate the vision and the language together because it's more scalable. It's not like a unit, you are uh, fixed. OK, one hot vector. You have a new task. This one hot vector go destroy it. It's not good. So the input should be vi uh, language and the image together, and the output is whatever you want. So this is a tiny difference, but I think it's uh, changed the uh, philosophy of the training data, uh, training the model uh, greatly. And finally, a very small part, I want to do the reader study, which uh, of course need uh, help from the radiologist. So I want to not only just um, um, perform really good in the international competition, I want to show the uh, clinical impact of a specific task applications. So we want to change, um, let the radiologist in and uh, evaluate the data, uh, the algorithm uh, more efficient. That's why we reach out to other company, other university to help us do the uh, software engineering to be able to get into the clinical setting. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much. This is uh, pretty much my talk. And if you have other questions, please let me know. When you say company, who, who are you talking about? Uh, NVIDIA. NVIDIA, yeah. <laughs> Monai, yeah. Right. Monai, yeah. They have team. I, I work pretty close to them. I use their GPU thanks to them. Then, <laughs> if they're listening. <laughs> thank, thank you very much if you're listening. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, in the, the, the flow charts, you mentioned about the iterative segmentation, that means the model in the Monai, right? Interra interactive, interactive segmentation means. Pretty. Human in the loop interactive segmentation. Is right. Similar. In it's Monai. one of the Monai function. It sounds like I'm selling Monai, but yeah, it's one of the function in Monai. It's called a Monai label, yeah. and it can incorporate your checkpoint into it. And uh, what you do is you sit down there, not uh, annotate from scratch. The model will give you prediction, and it will also give you attention map. Okay, this area you need to pay attention and correct the revise the label. Yeah. Then you submit the job and train the model again. Then the model will uh, like uh, fine tuned in the back end. Then, then you do it. You find hey, the the error I cracked, the model learned it. Then that's good. That's a human in the loop. Yeah. Any questions online? No. no? Uh, What's your attitude towards the recently public paper, Universal SAC? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a really good publication. Yeah, so we, we actually, like, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, we actually have a. To install the stuff. We have a README. Uh, if, if, if you see in the universal model GitHub, we have a list of all the paper that uh, it, I'm the not only believer of the universal model, the uh, other, many professors is doing this. And we have all this list. It's not our uh, like original thing. We're just a part of it. And uh, yeah, we review the universal SAG paper in that. <laughs> it's a really good one. <laughs> Cool. All right. Yep. I think we can wrap this up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.